Hello my friends, Jerry Rosa here in the Rosa Stringworks Man Cave. Mystery solved. I'll get to that in a minute, but it is solved. I know what it is. <laughs> Should have figured it out sooner actually. But I guess I was just hoping that it was Civil War related and turns out it's probably, well, for sure it's not. We'll be at Dickie's Barbecue Pit this evening. Come join us if you're in the area. We'll be there from about 6 to 8.30ish. And uh, picking and grinning and having a good time. Um, seems like everybody that attends it thoroughly enjoys it. So if you are in the area sometime or passing through on the first or third Tuesday of the month, that's when we're there, we'd love to have you. I'm holding the uh, auction guitar. This is the auction to benefit uh, Six String Heroes. The guitar is presently at $2,400, or it was a few minutes ago at least. And uh, you can't go wrong. It's a fine guitar. It really is. Yeah, it's got its little blemishes, but are you buying them for their looks or are you buying them for their sound and playability? This one has the looks sound and playability even though it does have a few little bobbles scar wise in terms of looks but uh, overall it still looks pretty good pick two or three tunes on a guitar and I can't do any of those very well but that doesn't take away from the guitar itself it is a nice guitar if you don't know how to get to the auction just go to my website www.rosastringworks.com and then just click on the shopping page and it's right at the bottom of the shopping page and you could uh, you'll have to register if you want to bid you do have to register that's on a different page on the website there is an actual registration page on the website register and then go back to the shopping cart there or the shopping page I mean and um, then you'll be able to bid it is a nice guitar uh, and I think it's gonna by the time the auction's over, I'm hoping that it'll bring in another thousand dollars or so. It'll be nice to uh, give a nice big hefty check to the uh, Six String Heroes organization. And those of you who'd like to participate in the donations part, even if you don't want to bid on the guitar, you can still donate. And uh, it's fairly easy to do. Just send me an email, rosastringworks at gmail.com. And then I will send you an invoice back and the invoice will include the tax ID number so that uh, when you make your donation, well, when you send me your email, tell me how much you want to donate. You know, if you want to donate $10 or $100, whatever it is, put, put that in the email and then I'll send you an invoice back for that amount. And then you can pay the invoice and we're all good to go. And I will write them a check for all those donations. And I do want to take this opportunity to say thank you very much to all those who have donated. And there have been quite a few, so thank you very kindly. I really do appreciate it. It would be nice to give them a nice big hefty check. And uh, I will be sure to tell them that it's from all my wonderful viewers. Um, let's see. Where are we at? Well, the um, water wheel project, it moved forward about that far. <laughs> Take a look at this. Well, those of you who have been keeping score know that the water wheel project is a huge project. I've done a lot of work on it already and now I've discovered that if I raise the uh, pipe that goes under the driveway, I can probably raise it by as much as 15 to 18 inches. And that'll give me a lot of clearance 
for my overshot water wheel. Well, let me rephrase that. It would make it possible to make an overshot water wheel. It won't give me any clearance. In fact, I'll still have to have the water wheel in the ground a little bit, but not so much. And uh, so it's worth doing. So here's the pipe that I got from over at JR's house. He got these things free. They're, they're about, uh, oh, I don't know, almost, a, it's probably 3 16 inch thick steel, it's a little, maybe an eighth inch thick, but it's uh, steel. And, uh, you know, it looks bad because it's got this black junk on it, but that doesn't matter. Anyway, uh, it's got things up inside it. Uh, there's like an auger that used to go through it. I've pulled these two pieces of steel out of there already, those two little pieces of steel you see laying there. I hooked onto those thinking I'd pull the whole thing out, but of course I didn't. There's another one of those kinds of pieces of steel about halfway up here in the middle somewhere. And there's some other little small pieces in there, so I don't know how we're gonna get that out and clean that out, but it'll make a good pipe. It's about the right length to go under the driveway, and it's a little smaller than what's in there, so that gives me a couple inches also. Um, anyway, I think it's a good deal, but nothing went right on this today, so I'm going to give it another shot tomorrow and see if I can figure out how to clean the rest of that pipe out so that I could uh, then dig the one out that goes under the driveway and put this in. I am decided to get this part done before I build the wall for the uh, water wheel mainly because I don't really know how high I'm going to want to mount the water wheel until I get this all done. And because uh, I want to mount the water wheel as high as I can mount it, and I won't know that till this is actually in place. Hope that makes sense. Yeah, so if, if you're kind of been following along, the spring is up high on the hill on the other side of the driveway. The spring runs down the hill a little bit in a trough that was made years ago, probably 75 to, well, probably older than that, probably close to 100 years ago by now. Nah, not that long. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it might have been that long. Actually, it might have been that long. might have been 100 years ago. They built a, a, a rock trough to funnel the spring down, and then it goes in a pipe under the driveway. Well, when they put that pipe in, first of all, they set it a little deeper than they absolutely had to, first of all. That's the first thing. And the bigger dip thing is that they put a lot of fall on it. It doesn't need a lot of fall. You know, um, you know, the standard line for almost everybody with plumbing is a quarter inch per foot. But actually, uh, it's really better on, on a larger diameter pipe to not even have it fall that much. Um, about an eighth inch uh, per foot fall is plenty. And so that's all I need. So if I, first of all, raise the pipe up a few inches, I can't raise it a lot, but maybe raise it up four or five inches. That, that gives me four or five inches. You know, every time you raise it a little bit, you get that much back on the height of my water wheel. So if I can raise the pipe in the ground about four inches, let's say, then change the fall uh, about another at least a good foot and maybe a little more than that, then, um, you know, I'm, I'm gaining 16, 18 inches, you know, somewhere in that neighborhood. And what that does is, see the axe, presently, to get an overshot water wheel, presently, the way it is right now, the way the, the height of the water coming out of that pipe now, um, I'd have to drop the water wheel down so that the water can still shoot over the top of it. And when I drop it down enough right now, then the axle for the water wheel is only about this high above the floor, uh, that concrete floor that I poured. Well, that's not real desirable. And that puts the wheel way down low on the building. And I don't really want that either. So if I can, you know, if I've got, say, six inches presently now, and I can get another 16 inches, well, then now I'm up 22 inches above the floor. That's quite a bit. And that raises it up out of the ground. And then you might say, well, how can you have it down in the ground? Well, you don't really, in a sense. You're gonna ha I'll have to dig a big trough in there, a big trench, so the wheel can spin. My plan is, whatever amount of trough I have, I'm going to line it with rock all the way around. So the water, you know, it, it'll just make it look better. That, that way it won't just be a big muddy ditch down through there. It'll be lined with rock. So at least it'll look good. 
uh, it just, yeah, every single step is a lot of work. There's nothing simple about this project. You know, it, it, people have uh, ideas about, and even me, I mean, I had ideas that this wouldn't be that big a deal, though I kind of knew going in that we were talking a major project here because I knew first thing I had to do was reroute where the water was on the pond and raise the pond level a little bit. And, you know, I wanted to get all that done first so that I knew what I was working with there. And I rerouted where the pond exited. So I've done all that. Then I had to excavate the uh, wall there along the road and put in that big rock wall, uh, you know, block wall, I guess you'd say. Then I had to pour the concrete for the foundation. And now I'm working on the water level coming out of the spring. So it just is what it is. I've already got the water wheel itself built, as you've seen. So it's just another step in that, uh, you know, just another cog in the wheel or something, if you want to call it that way. But anyway, I'm making progress, and hopefully I'll get that pipe figured out today. And I don't know if I'll get it in the ground today, but I might. I might be able to get it. But cleaning the pipe out first is the first problem. Yeah, I could just go buy a pipe, and that might be the easier thing to do. And that's not off the table yet. I may just have to go buy one. But uh, I think I can get this thing figured out and cleaned out, and then I don't have to spend the money for the, for the pipe. And the other thing is they sell those pipes in 20-foot links. I need 23 or 4 feet. 23 will get me by. 24 would be better. And so if I had to go buy one, well, then I'd have to buy two of them and put them together. And that's it. They're ex expensive, you know, and I'd waste most of the second pipe, you know. So anyway, it, it, this would be a good deal if I can make it work. Okay, mystery solved. You know, I've been saying, what kind of bullet is this thing? I got it figured out. I know what it is. Night. 99.9% .9 sure now, you know, and again, I always leave the little door open because you never do know you could be wrong still, but I'm pretty positive I got it figured out now. As I've been doing a lot of metal detecting, you know, I've been finding all kinds of Civil War relics, so I was hoping to tie this to the Civil War because it looks like it could be that old. Well, it's not quite that old. It's still probably still in the late 1800s, Possibly early 1900s, though. It is possible. Um, but, you know, cartridges, when they first came out, they came out in black powder. Um, you know, like there's a Spencer cartridge. And I've already found, and I'll just show you this. I, uh, I, there's a Spencer cartridge that came out in 1860. And, eight, and it was the Spencer repeating rifle. And they did use them a little bit in the Civil War. Uh, had they you know, one side or the other had just Spencer rifles, they would have won because it was superior technology. But on the other hand, uh, the generals were a little bit uh, skeptical of any kind of new technology. They knew tried and true, you know what I'm saying? So they didn't use it as much as they could have possibly. But I have found Spencer cartridges here. And here's, let's take a look at that. I This is not what I found. This, this is, you know, a picture off the internet. But um, I have found this exact same thing. I found the bullets at, that you can see on the, on the left there. I've seen, I mean, I found the bullet in, just the lead part on the top. And then I found the casing that's below there. And if you see the writing on the end of the casing there on my right, uh, or on the right of the screen, I should say, um, uh, that says F, uh, V, and V, or F dot V dot V is what it's supposed to say. That one doesn't show up very good, but it's Fitch Van Vecht and Company. And those were manufactured during the Civil War. And I have found those exact cartridges here on the farm. Uh, and they were used during the Civil War. It's just absolutely blows my mind that I'm finding this kind of stuff here on this farm just blows my mind. I never dreamed I'd find absolute positive 100% proof that there are Civil War stuff here, but I have, and it's definitely very cool in my opinion. But anyway, I've, so I have found stuff like that. So when I found this, and knowing how old it looks, I thought this is definitely from the turn of the century at minimum. You know, I, I knew 
late 1800s, early 1900s. This could be from that, but I was hoping it might go all the way back to the Civil War. Well, it turns out it probably dates from the late 1880s or, or uh, maybe even 1890s. I mean, it probably dates from like uh, 88 to uh, uh, 99, somewhere in there, you know, uh, in the late 1800s. Now, it could be 1900s also. So while, you know, I've told you yesterday, or I think it was yesterday, that I have found just like a hundred bullets or more uh, of just more like modern type ammunition. And, uh, you know, some of it I knew was really old, uh, like the 303. I found some 303 cartridges, and that's what this is. And, you know, looking it up with this type of cartridge, you know, there's information on the butt end here that you can look up. And I knew this was from the late 1800s, early 1900s, this 303 cartridge. Well, guess what? It fits it exactly. And look at this. You can see here, that's what it looks like. That is... If you look at the end of that bullet, it matches what I found pretty darn close. In fact, it's in fact it's just real close, and that accounts for the rifling marks as well, um, and that also accounts for this crimp around the uh, neck of the bullet. Um, let me go back to the big camera. You know, I, I kept saying there's this crimp around it. Why would that crimp be there? Well, that crimp probably lined it, lined up right with the end of the, the brass casing here. Um, 99.9% .9 sure we've got the mystery solved. Uh, it fits it like a glove, you know. So I think that's pretty cool. Um, again, it's still very old. It's still, you know, well over 100 years old. So, anyway, I think that takes care of that. Um, I knew there had to be a story to it, and I wanted to know what it was. And, you know, really, the guy's comment yesterday about it being a modern bullet. <clears throat> now, by the way, this was still black powder. Yeah, this definitely was still black powder. 1888 is when the 303 was introduced, and it was introduced with black powder. They were trying to come in with the smokeless powder with this uh, cartridge, but uh, some, some, I don't remember what the politics was, but something caused it to come out with black powder first. And so this did come out in black powder, and that's what I expected it would have been, you know, with this type of bullet and everything. I think they once they came out with the smokeless powder, they streamlined the bullet even more, you know. Um, because that bullet's going really fast when you when you go with the smokeless powder. So, that's everything I know about everything, so let's go to the comments. Uh, Ed Turner, good morning. He, he was the first one. Uh, Carolyn Fikes there, and John Pepper, Rod Wintler. Looking for question marks. The spoken song, good morning from ne N -E, Northeast Ohio. I, started, I thought that was short for Nebraska because of the sta state N-E. But uh, anyway, I got you. Uh, let's see, moving on down, uh, Joe Everett, hello all, like Jerry's song yesterday, it reminded me of Tom T. Hall's music. Well, thank you, uh, Tom T. Hall was quite a songwriter, I don't think I quite rate in his league, but, uh, yeah, thank you anyway. <laughs> Just to even have his name mentioned alongside mine sounds really cool. Dottie Hildebrand, praying for all my friends who need prayers in Jerry's hands. Thank you very kindly. We are praying for you. I know you said you're uh, all black and blue from your blood test there. My goodness. Uh, moving on down, here's some question marks from Bill Rhodes. Jerry, I'd like to apologize because my phone didn't type what I was saying. I thought what... Uh, <laughs> I thought that Bull might has something to do uh, with a blasting cap, that bullet. Okay, yeah. Well, now I think we know what it is. <laughs> I'm almost sure. See, I had found a bunch of these 303s, and I knew they were very old. That's why I saved them. Uh, I didn't save all the cartridges. In fact, a lot of the cartridges, I find them more mo the ones that are even more modern than this. I consider this a modern cartridge. And that's why when he made the just the term modern cartridge, I thought, yeah, that does make sense. To me, this is still what I call a modern cartridge. You know, um, 
the old tamp it down the barrel. That's what I refer to as the old style. This is modern cartridge, but it's still an old modern modern cartridge. It's still well over 100 years old. Uh, so that's what made me think to look at this this morning. And, and really, I just figured this out this morning. Well, I started suspecting it yesterday after he made the comment. And then this morning, I decided to look it up and, and double check it. And sure enough, all the information checked out exactly like it should. So thank you, Bill. No, no problem. I, I understand, uh, you know, my, a lot of times whenever you're speaking into a phone or whatever, it uh, voice recognition doesn't work very well. And, and even when you're typing in, a lot of times, like you said, autocorrect and things will change things. It's just nuts. That's what we get for living in this automated, wonderfully smart world. <laughs> Sometimes it's not as smart as we think it is. Bill Mumbo, hello, fellow rabblers. What does rabble rousing roser require today? <laughs> you can't say that five times real fast. Uh, let's see. Moving on down. Um, again, mostly looking for question marks. I don't read fast enough to read all the comments, unfortunately. Um, uh, Bill Mumbo. Spring sprung in London. The ma uh, magpies are mobbing a crafty cat. <laughs> Squirrels are flashing around the near naked trees in pairs and a portly pigeon <laughs> is presently pursuing <laughs> dove it's all going on um well there you go there bill you should be a writer man you you, you got a, a gift of uh you know putting words together <laughs> i don't know a better way to say it um let's see Bill Mumbo just received my tickets for the Procrastinator Society Summer Ball in November. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, Dottie Hildebrand, solve must be the bullet. Yes, you are right. It is the mystery solved. Um, I'm pretty sure that's, I'm 99.9% .9 sure we're done with that now. Okay, uh, moving on down. Let's see. Yeah, the only other mystery would just be how it got fired out of a cartridge like this and still ended up in almost perfect shape, you know. And you can tell it was fired because it's got the riflings from going down the barrel. So obviously it was fired. But it must not have hit anything. That's Like I said, you can't stick an ice pick without hitting a rock. So how did it not hit anything? <laughs> Ooh, maybe it went into a body and fell out later as the body rotted away. Ooh, morbid, morbid. Uh, anyway, that, anything's possible. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, moving on down. Don't see any more question marks before we go live. Walt Willard looks like he was the first one after we went live. And uh, Charles Salkowitz is there, Blackjack Guitar. Moving on down for the question marks, I see Dottie has some. If you want the pipe cleaned out, hook a chain through the pipe, hook a small tire, and pull it out with your bobcat. Yeah, except it's way harder than that. <laughs> I, I had chains hooked around quite a bit of it already, and pulling with the bobcat on one way and the big heavy tractor on the other way. And, uh, yeah, it, it ain't coming out with a rubber tire. I can tell you that it's, it's in there. Um, but we got, you know, some of it out and I'm hoping I'll get the rest of it out. But in fact, what we think we might try is we have, we found a, a short piece of, well, a fairly long piece of pipe that we think will reach that center piece and I'll take the bobcat bucket and push this pipe through the other pipe and see if I can push that centerpiece at least closer to the end where we can get a chain on it or something. Because right now, you can't hardly get a chain on it or through it because of all the stuff that's in there. It's a mess. Like I said, if it's easy, I already got it done, guys. I mean, you know, not trying to brag here, but if it's easy, I pretty much Got it figured out. Whenever I having trouble with something, you can pretty much bet it ain't easy. <laughs> it 
Zappo says, uh, Jerry, could you replace the gravel path of the spring with clay pipe to keep from losing water to the soil? Yeah, you probably could, but it's a lot of dang work. Um, and it looks rustic, it looks cool, and it was done over 100 years ago, so I'm just going to keep the look. I am going to go through there and... Uh, I'm going to try to reroute the water temporarily. See, this is just more of the project that's getting bigger. The scope of the project just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and I can't help it. You know, it's all got to be done, in my opinion. Um, but I want to go back through there and tuck point all the rocks and, and make sure that they're, you know, good and solid and to avoid, again, water loss. Because there is some water loss, you're correct. Uh, but not that much. I mean, it seems to be working pretty well. Um, moving on down. Bill Webb, uh, the crimp is to keep the lead part of the bullet attached to the copper jacket. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, that's why I said that's what lines up there. And then when they size these things, they put them in a sizer and that, that put, pulls the uh, uh, jacket down tight around the bullet too. So... Yeah, that's what the crimp was for. Um, pretty cool. Uh, at least I think I got the mystery solved anyway. Uh, Zappa's asking, is, would this be the first jacketed bullet? Um, that I don't know, but it wouldn't. it's kind of interesting to know. I, I would guess it's one of the very early ones. Um, very early ones. Might be. Cup of cool. Mr. Rosa, I believe you misled us a minute ago when you said you would end up washing half of the second pipe regarding the water wheel project. I've never seen you throw away or waste anything. Okay, I'm not sure what you mean there. Wasting half of the second pipe. Well, let's say it this way, just to in case anybody has any questions. If there's any scrap metal left over, it'll go to the recycler eventually. Most of the time, you know, a lot of times, stuff doesn't make it to the recycler because I'll pull it out of the iron pile back there and, and weld it up to something else. <laughs> I, you'd be surprised. I mean, like, there's hardly a day goes by where I don't go back to that big iron pile behind the shop and pull something out of it, cut a piece off of it, weld a piece to something else, you know, something. I mean, always. It's just, it's like having a hardware store there behind the shop. I do it all the time. I mean, it's not like a once in a month thing. It's like a once a week thing at minimum and sometimes once a day. Um... Gary Hyden, looking forward to your next live concert. Well, thanks. We're kind of looking forward to that, too, because uh, Leon should be back for that one. In fact, Leon, I think, will be there tonight. I'm hoping he will be. I haven't talked to him, but I think he will be. Mark's there. Good morning, Mark. Mitzi Odin. Hello, Jerry. I'm enjoying your vlogs. Glad you solved the riddle of the bullet. Well, thank you. I'm glad I solved it too. Or because, you know, and again, it's with help from you guys that inputs. You know, it's it's not that I wouldn't have got around to that eventually. Because I think I probably would have. Because that's kind of what I thought it was all along. Except that I was hoping it was even older and it was going to be a Civil War thing. But when he said modern bullet, I thought, well, I got some really old modern bullets. That's probably what it is. You know, it, I, modern bullet, though, to me, says from the 1950s on or something, or 40s on, you know, or, or something like that. You know, from the World Wars on, let's say it that way. Um, and I'm thinking this is older than that. And it, and it is. I, I'm sure it's older than that. But anyway, that, but that did make me think about it. Uh, it really did. Just, just that comment's what made me think about it. Uh, moving down here. Jeff Puris, I recently purchased a classical guitar from music studio I go to. I may have a two-way truss rod, horrors, 
Uh, can I move the adjustment to find the neutral position so I know where I am? Well, for me, Jeff, it's, it's a very simple process. But see, then again, I'm really mechanically inclined. You know what I mean? And I don't mean that as a brag. I've been doing it since I was just a little kid. So to me, it's second nature. It's like you can't screw it up type of thinking with me, you know, with me. And yet I know it can be screwed up. The point is that it's, it's, it's just as simple as the little rhyme, righty tighty, lefty loosey, you know, and it's just that simple. So if you want to tighten your truss rod, you'll go to the right. If it, if it's getting tighter, well, then, you know, it's adjusted properly, probably. When you loosen it up, it'll get to a point where it's sloppy loose. That'll be your neutral ground. When you keep going lefty, it'll start getting tighter again. You know it's wrong when you're doing that. Don't do that. So it's just neutral or to the right um, is really all it amounts to. I mean, you go to you would go to the left to get to your neutral, obviously, uh, if it is already adjusted properly. It wouldn't surprise me at all if it's adjusted backwards. It would not surprise me at all. Because like I said, and I'm, I know you probably think, oh, it couldn't be that bad. I'm not kidding you. It's that bad. Eight out of ten of them that have come into the shop with two-way truss rods have been adjusted backwards. Eight out of ten of them. I got a witness. You know, um, Caleb was there. He saw it. He knows that that's true. Eight out of ten of them came on adjusted backwards. I've never seen anything like it. It's the dumbest thing <laughs> to me. To, it doesn't even make sense to me. Uh, and that's why you don't need a tr two-way truss rod. You never need to force an, um, uh, an, uh, an underbow in a neck. It's going to pull an underbow in a neck. You don't ever need to force an underbow. And I know there's every time I say that, somebody has to argue with me about it. I've been doing it for 40 years, and I ain't never seen one that you need to force an underbow in. Uh, if you need to force an underbow in, then you've got a different problem, and you need to fix the problem. And that is that you've got an overbowed neck. You need to cut that bow out of there and flatten it out. There's your problem. That's, you know, it, you're fixing a problem the wrong way if you're fixing it with a two-way truss rod. You're not fixing the problem properly. You're putting a Band-Aid on it. Okay, that's enough of that. Uh, but anyway, that's how you would know it. It's just righty-tighty, lefty-loosey. Mark Nasdem, Yolanda and I saw your granddaughter down at the railroad bridge. We were hunting morels. I'll be darned. They were all over next to the riverbanks. About 100 were found. And lots of Lone Star ticks. Oh my gosh, the ticks are the worst ever this year year. Oh my gosh. I've had nine or ten attached already and uh, I've, caught, I've found that many crawling too. The ticks are terrible and, and right now it's turkey season and I'm not even interested in going because the ticks are so bad. It's, it's unbelievable how bad the ticks are. Yep and Mark's asking are we playing at Dickies? Yep we for sure are. Um, Let's see, Bill Rhodes, will you be having a concert tonight? A concert tonight? Well, at Dickie's, yes. Um, let's see, next week, Thursday night, the 25th, will be our excuse me, monthly live concert. So next week, Wednesday, or, uh, Thursday, the 25th, will be our next live concert. Um... Jekko46, good morning, Mr. Rosa. How is Cash doing with his guitar? Maybe you could have him on some time. I really enjoyed his progress. Uh, I'll tell you what, Cash was at the jam last Friday night at, uh, well, it's at a new location. It's at a church on the outskirts of Rolla toward, uh, uh, it's on the back roads. Uh, I, I, I forget now the name of the road. B, I think it is, Highway B, uh, which is... 10th Street when you're coming through Rolla. Anyway, you just go out 10th Street uh, towards St. James, and uh, it's a few miles out of town on the right. There's a little church, and we had the jam there Friday night, and uh, Cash was there, and uh, 
he was killing it. He was killing it. I, he, he was on fire. I, he, he had it exactly right. Uh, I think what, where he had, you know, some people pointed out that he didn't allow a pause when he was picking that Johnny Cash song in his contest. And you were right. I mean, he didn't. But I think it was all nerves. Um, cause you know, when I had him do it for me, you know, after that, I had him play in the shop once and he played it fine. And then Friday night, not only did he do that tune, but he did a lot of other tunes. And for the very first time, he learned his own song completely by himself. And he didn't pick a simple song. He picked Country Roads by John Denver. Now, if anybody knows anything about it, that's got a few minors in it. And uh, I, I said, are you sure you want to try that? <laughs> He's going, yep. And I go, okay. He nailed it. He nailed it. I was, I was so floored when he did that. I was like, wow. <laughs> he just, I was really proud of him. So I told his grandma, I said, I think the lesson's stuck, <laughs> you know, because, wow, he went from couldn't play nothing, in my opinion. He went from couldn't play nothing, even after taking, I don't know, how many years of lessons he took, at least two, and I'm thinking three or four years of lessons, because he started when he was really little, um, taking lessons. And, um, yeah, he went from, like, couldn't play nothing to now he can he, the boy can play. It's pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing. And his, uh, his next, uh, uh contest, the, 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 I mean, the, uh, the follow-up contest, because that was the state competition and he won the state competition. Now he has to go to, um, uh, Georgia for the, um, I guess national competition and that's held in June. So that's when he's going down there. Uh, as far as I know, they think that he has to play the same song again. Now, I was hoping he'd do a different one. Now, let me just tell you, this could sound self-serving. It, it's not really. I, I don't think it is. He rewrote the words to my song, Grandpa's Old Fiddle, to fit his, his life and his grandpa. And his grandpa was his big inspiration to play music, just like mine was. Um, anyway, he, um, he wrote the... Uh, rewrote the words, you know, instead of fiddle, of course, it's guitar, because his grandpa played guitar, instead of, uh, you know, lived on the Blue Springs at the, or he lived on the current river at the mouth of Blue Springs, is what I said, and he changed it around to that he, uh, you know, lived on the Jack's Fork something, I, I can't remember exactly what he said, but he changed the words around, you know, to make it meaningful for him, and he asked me before he did it, he asked me if that would be okay, and I said, absolutely, just knock yourself out, you know, and so he did that Friday night. Now, in my opinion, that's the song he needs to play at the contest because he nailed it. He, he nailed it. It was really good. And he did a really good job on it. Um, and I, I think that's the one he should play at the contest and tell the story behind it, you know. And, uh, but I don't know if they will allow it, you know. And in fact, other people that were there said, yep, that's the one you need to play, you know, because uh, he did a really good job on it. Well, anyway, he's doing great. He's, I really couldn't be more proud. Uh, like I said, I've had such good luck with the kids that I've taught. I can't believe where they've gone. You know, it's just amazing. You know, uh, one of the early ones played with uh, Daly and Vincent, played banjo for them uh, for uh, th the three years that they won Entertainer of the Year. Uh, he was playing banjo for him, and then he went over to uh, Doyle Lawson and played with him for over, well, about a decade. He played with Doyle. So there you go. Uh, I've had some really good luck with my students. Uh, let's see. Uh, Jeff Pierce, thank you. That was pretty much what I thought. I had to back off the truss rod a little to help relief, and it worked uh, the right direction. Yeah, and um, what I would only, the only other thing I would say about that, especially with a two-way, well, it's really with any truss rod, doesn't matter, is even if you have to back off just your regular truss rod, the point is that you, you don't want it ever loose. You know, even if if you have to back it all the way off, that's fine. I get it. But then you want to snug it back so that you don't have any rattles because the truss rod itself can rattle and so can the washer and the nut and all that. So you want to just snug it back to where it's just snug, just enough so it doesn't rattle. 
Um, okay, moving on down. Zappa. Uh, just checked. Stumac, a two-way truss rod, will have a hex key adjustment, not a nut. Uh, yeah, well, that's probably true. I, it doesn't really matter. It's just an adjustment. So to me, I don't care what you call it. It's all on what you do with it. That's what I always say. It doesn't matter what the word is. It doesn't matter what the, you know, the proper everything English perfect thing is. It matters if you know how to use it. That's what matters to me. And I'm a bottom line kind of guy. Do you know what to do with it? <laughs> That's what I want to know. If you know what to do with it, we're all good. Uh, Jeff Puris uh, is the last one there. And that doesn't look like it's a question, though. Uh, the guitar has a hex key adjustment in the sound hole uh, end of the neck. Yeah, and that can be either way. I mean, you can have them at the peg head. You can have them in the sound hole. I mean, there's a gazillion different ways. And most of them nowadays, especially if they're through the sound hole, almost all of them are hex key because there'd be no way to get a wrench on it. 99.9% um, .9 of them would be a hex key. Um, in, in through the sound hole. If they're at the other end, it can be a hex key still, or it can be a nut. Um, anyway, I think that's everything I know about. Um, thank you all for being here. 183 viewers. That's a pretty good number. And uh, hope you're happy to, as I am to, to mystery solve. You don't have to hear about it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for being here. We'll be back with something tomorrow. Uh, if you can make it to Dickie's tonight, be there. We'll see you then. Yeah, yeah.